Welcome to the Weekly Leadership Experience, a place for leaders to get inspired, be challenged, and grow. I am your host, Rashad Oberlander. Let's get started. Today's episode of the Weekly Leadership Experience is brought to you by my 7-Day Leadership Growth Challenge. It's a free challenge that I've created, and it's delivered by email over the course of 7 days. I've created seven compelling questions to challenge various aspects of your leadership, the way you lead, and why you lead. Go to rashadoberlander.com and scroll down until you find the seven-day leadership challenge, or look for the link in the show notes. Today's review comes from Manfred over on the CastBox app, reviewing a recent episode with Dr. Johanna Pagonis says, loved this episode. Great conversation with a couple great challenges. I found the very idea about who your team would choose as their leader between yourself and other popular leaders to be very thought provoking. You want to be that leader that people choose, but you have to check your ego and motivations. Really great episode this week and every week. Thank you, Manfred, for the wonderful review. Really appreciate it. If you're wanting to leave me a review, you can go to ratethispodcast.com slash weekly leader. And it's going to take you to your favorite platform of choice where you can leave a rating and a review for me. And I'll be featuring some reviews on upcoming episodes of the Weekly Leadership Experience. In the meantime, let's get on with the show. Hello, leaders, and welcome to this week's episode. I'm excited to be joined today by Luis Gonzalez. Luis is a communications consultant, coach, and trainer with more than 25 years' experience in helping improve business outcomes for organizations. He has successfully driven learning initiatives, incorporating effective communication, cross-cultural communication, customer satisfaction, and soft skills training. Currently, Lewis works with, closely with CEOs, leaders, and individuals, positively impacting business outcomes through effective communication in global, multicultural, and remote work team settings. Lewis has lived and worked in India, Mexico, and Brazil, and he's a keynote speaker and is a member of the Association for Training and Development, Association of International Educators, and the Society for International Education Training and Research. Lewis, welcome to the Weekly Leadership Experience. Thank you, Rashad. It's a pleasure to be here with you with the Weekly Leadership Experience. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I'm glad to have you. I'm excited to get stuck into the subject of having difficult conversations um, but, uh, you know, you, you tell us a little bit about yourself. You've worked for Microsoft, married international Ritz Carlton, and you're now a master facilitator at fierce. Tell us a bit about your journey. Wow. Okay. Well, I've been, as you mentioned and recognized internationally training for over 20 years. I've lived in Mexico, India, Brazil with those organizations you mentioned, Marriott, Ritz Carlton, Microsoft, to name a few, but In regards to what I do and how I got there, in terms of communication training, effective communication training, I grew up in a place called Compton, California. So maybe some of your listeners may have heard of Compton, California. It does have a reputation. I grew up there in the 70s. And in those days, it was a very multicultural, racially mixed environment. I come from a Mexican-American background myself, a lot of African-Americans around me and many other cultures around me as well, especially at school. And I would see different, I guess you could say, communication breakdowns. Now, everyone's speaking English, but I would always see that there would be chokes in communications or breakdowns in communications or misunderstandings, even though everyone was speaking English. And even as a kid, I remember thinking to myself, how is that happening? And being kind of an empath and a bridge builder and all that, I always wanted to get in there and go, no, what they mean is, no, what they're trying to say is, and trying to bridge that gap. Well, um, when I found myself at the Ritz-Carlton, here in Los Angeles, actually Orange County, uh, south of Los Angeles, we had a lot of people from all over the world coming to visit that hotel. And I've always been curious about what other people do and why they do it that way and interested in other cultures and languages as well and their, how they communicate. And with that exposure, it gave me more of an interest into you know how is it that people communicate and what was the trigger for me to tell and what triggered me when I told myself this is exactly what I want to do in terms of, you know, helping people communicate more effectively was Mm -hmm. when I made a mistake, a cultural communication mistake. I assumed guests coming into the hotel were from a particular culture. I assumed that because of the way they were dressed and the way they looked and all of that. And I was one country off. 
And I insulted them, if that makes any sense. Yes, similar cultures, but different religions. It was India, Pakistan. I mm. greeted some Pakistanis who came into the hotel for a wedding party with a namaste. That's not how they greet in Pakistan. That's not how Muslims greet. So I, automatically, I offended them in the hotel, in the at the Ritz Carlton Hotel of all places. That really gave me a lot of thinking, and I thought, okay, I, I want to learn more about this cross cultural communication and effective communication. Went to grad school, quit the hotel business. I had a pretty lucrative career with hospitality in the Marriott and the Ritz. After 18 years, I decided to go back to grad school and I got my uh, master's degree in international relations with a focus on culture and communication. That led me to Microsoft in India, where I worked for a couple of years as a culture and communication specialist, where I worked with Indian software engineers who were experts in their field, many of whom were Anglo Indians, meaning they spoke English at home too, communicating with high-end Microsoft partners in the United States and Canada. And again, everyone's speaking English, but there's still these cultural contexts that cause communication breakdowns. A lot of fun for me. It's kind of how I got into that. That was the route I took. The exposure that I got at the Ritz, I think, is what really piqued my interest and was the trigger for me to just go to school, focus on this, and get my career going in it. And so now I work with fierce conversations where there's less right now of an international context. I suspect that'll change right now, mostly working in the U.S. and Canada, a little bit in Latin America with effective communication. And given with our given our current reality with COVID and everyone working remotely or many people working remotely, now an added uh, component to what we're teaching is working with remote teams, which is also what I did at Microsoft, working with glo we call the global teams. Now it's just everybody's global, it's remote. So long, uh, windy answer to your question about how I got to where I am today, but that's that's how I got here. Yeah, love what I do. Yeah, and that's great to hear. You know, the I think the the finding out about the journey and there's lessons to be learned there. And I love hearing people's kind of life story a little bit in terms of what got them to this point, because, you know, there's always something that each of us can learn from, from that story. Um, <clears throat> something that you and your organization that you talk about is radical candor. Can we unpack that a little bit, you know, radical candor, what does that mean? And what are we looking for? Sure. So radical candor is a kind of a general term that's out there, if you will, in leadership and development and other worlds and realms. And we specifically with our organization, we call our version or brand of it as fierce conversations. Right. In any case, fierce conversations are, 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 can, are candid conversations. So what we mean is saying what you know you should say or need to say or want to say, what is your truth? We tend to hold back from that as human beings. I mean, think about your personal life, what to speak of, you know, our professional lives. We fear the backlash. We fear the fallout. We fear being wrong. We fear looking incompetent. We fear hurting someone's feelings. So I want to give them feedback, but ooh, you know, how will they take it? And will it rock the boat of our relationship? I have to work with this person or what have you, or even in personal relationships, What's deepest on our hearts, sometimes we hold back from our partners for fear of something, fear of hurting them, but it's our truth. So what we teach, what I teach, what I share, I like to say I share with other people because it's not really rocket science, is how to do that and how to do that in the business world because we're working with businesses and organizations and teams and we want to help them improve their results. So let's focus on the business aspect of it for a moment. If I have this fear of not speaking up, I see something in a process that eventually is going to affect the customer in, 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 in a negative way, but hey, it's not my, what, how do they say it? It's not my lane, not my, you know, ah, not my job, not my job description. I'll let it ride. There is a cost to that. There's a risk to that. In, in the hotel and, and health, sorry, in, in the healthcare industry, there's risks to not speaking up. And the risk could be someone's life. In other industries, there's risks of not speaking up, which could be great danger. In an office setting, there's the risk of not speaking up, which could cause the loss of clients. And before it gets to loss of clients, could cause a negative work environment. People aren't feeling valued, perhaps. They start looking for other jobs while on the job. They leave the job, etc. So there are so many risks and costs, dangers sometimes, if you will, to not speaking up. Mm -hmm. So how do we speak up in a way <laughs> that is feels safer for us, but we're still being candid and 
in a way that doesn't, as I say, my language, rock other people's boats, or we say it fierce, and rich relationships. I should be able to tell you my truth, Rashad. And even though you may disagree with it, even though you may not like hearing it, you respect me for it. Our relationship is enriched because it took courage, perhaps, for me to share that with you. So mm-hmm. that's kind of what we do. Mm. Interesting. Um, I think it's an, an important subject material. And obviously, you mentioned like th- there's some, some folks out there talking about the idea of radical candor. I, I guess what I, would, what I would lead on from that f- previous question is, is like, how do you begin to encourage that in your team? How do you begin to encourage radical candor in your team? Yeah. It starts with this, and this is this is interesting. And like I said, it's not rocket science, but it made perfect sense when I became aware of it. Start with curiosity first. So going into any kind of a conversation, any conversation, personal, professional, up, down, and across, go in with curiosity first instead of going in with making your point or asserting yourself or, you know, stating your case or whatever it is. So it begins with what we say is interrogating reality. So Rashad, how do you see it? How are you interpreting the situation? How did you come up with that solution? And getting more curious, tell me more about that. And the key to that curiosity is I'm genuinely interested because we human beings are pretty good at sniffing out when people are not genuine with us. So I'm genuinely interested. Rashad, how do you see it? Tell me more about that. Am I understanding you correctly? What I'm hearing you say is that tells you I'm really listening. I'm really hearing you. And you're engaged. And so that builds a little more trust. You may then turn to me and say, well, what do, what do you think, Luis? How do you see it? And that's where I can share my different perspective. Hey, Rashad, I see how you see it that way. But guess what? I see it completely differently. (laughs) I have a whole different way of looking at this. And so how I teach teams and how I teach individuals how to look at this is it's perspective. We all have reality. reality. We all have our own reality. We all have our own perspective. And in my respect, excuse me, my reality, I'll call it reality for the moment. My reality might be quite different from yours. We experience this all the time in everyday life. Reality changes. We change. We forget to send out a memo. We forget to tell people. What was important yesterday may not be important today, especially in this year, 2020. Things are changing all the time. We've got to pivot all the time. So the key is going in with curiosity, first of all, interrogating reality, digging deeper, not being satisfied on the surface. In other words, tell me more, Rashad. What else? Who else? How else? And then sharing my thoughts on it, which might be different from yours. And it's okay because these are just different perspectives. Now, people may get passionate about their perspective, and we can certainly have another fierce conversation about, okay, we disagree on which plan to go down, A or B. Okay, that requires another type of a conversation. But that's how we start is with curiosity. When we're curious, when we interrogate reality, then we provoke learning. Ah, I see how you see it. I may see it differently than you, but I see how you see it. I see how it came that way. I see how you've interpreted it that way, if that makes sense. So I'll, I'll pause there, Rashad. It does. And um, I'm going to interject here uh, a listener question. I um, I mentioned to a few of my listeners that I was having a conversation coming up with someone in the communications field, right? Um, and I said, well, what kind of questions would you like to ask? So I'll preface this by saying being candid and being... Um, you know, kind of having these somewhat tough conversations, let's say, is sometimes difficult. So yes. here's here's the listener question. Okay. As a leader, how do you encourage and facilitate healthy communication amongst your team, even during difficult conversations? First of all, it starts with the relationship and the conversation, which builds trust. So right. let me start by saying you've got to connect. We we human beings are hardwired emotionally first, rationally second. So what I mean by that is it's important for us to connect with those around us, be they our bosses, be they our subordinates, be they the people that we work with, our our, our colleagues. Connecting on a human level, now that looks different between any two individuals, but it's not the business as usual. It's just connecting 
uh, on a human level, if you will. So say, for example, if you and I are working together on a team, we're, you know, co-workers, we're working remotely. We may hop on a Zoom call just like this, but I may spend 30 seconds just checking in with you. How was your weekend, Rashad? How was your Thanksgiving holiday, man? Good to see you. What's, you know, whatever it is, making that genuine connection, that builds trust, first of all. Once the trust is built, then you're able to build on that trust and encourage more different types of conversations. Now, when you're talking about leaders, leaders building trust on their team, again, this is another thing that I say, it starts with checking in with your people genuinely making a connection, I say with your people, with your team, with the people who report to you, right? Um, I have worked for so many leaders in my day, and I can tell you the difference between a leader that is a top-down leader that, you know, has the order of the day, that has the expectations, and we fulfill those expectations, and it's all good, and I get my paycheck, versus the leader who did all of that and cared enough to check in with me and say, how you been, man? You got a lot on your plate. What's keeping you up at night? How can I support you? That builds trust more than anything. That's the start right there is just making that human connection. We call it emotional emotional capital. Um, and as I mentioned, there's science that proves, um, you know, that we're emotionally driven beings. And so your results, let's talk about the business world, of course, it's what we do every day. Our results are going to improve when we build that emotional capital with people around us, when we know we have that trust and those connections. And it starts with a conversation. It starts with just checking in. Now, when I used to facilitate and train these workshops in the buildings, when pre-COVID days, the question would come up, well, you know, there's some people that... Um, they don't want to talk about their personal lives. They don't want to talk about their family or what they did on the weekend. They just want to come in and they want to do their jobs and that's it. Okay, great. Well, then the onus is on us to find out where that connection point is to start that conversation. It could be something as simple as like what I said a minute ago. Wow, I know you got a lot on your plate, right? Any support I can give you? Anything I can do to help or anything like that? And they may look at you and say, hey, no, thanks. Carry on, but you've made that genuine connection. That's where the trust starts. So I'll, I'll pause there. I'm not sure if I answered the question. I may have gone down a rabbit hole. I think I think you did. I think it it makes sense what you're saying. Um, it really starts with building relationships with your team, which I'm a fan of uh, John Maxwell's five levels of leadership. And you know, you get position. The next thing is relationship. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. Um, so coming into one another listener question. You know, sometimes, you know, we're talking about having difficult conversations right now. And like some of those conversations are, you know, feedback related or someone did a bad job, you know, or they made an error or mistake, whatever the case is. There's some feedback. There's maybe something more formal that needs to be communicated um, are having difficult. This is a listener question from uh, Nick in BC. Okay. Are having difficult conversations something that should be planned out? And if so, what strategies can you share about this? Um, difficult conversations, I would not wing them for sure. So I do believe they should be planned out, thought out. Um, you heard me mention earlier, get curious, interrogate reality. So with a difficult conversation, I check with myself first. I interrogate my own reality first. Okay, so I need to have a difficult or a challenging uh, conversation with this person. What was my role in it? What role, if any, did I play in it? What could I have done differently uh, did I set the expectation too high? Did I not communicate, uh, in a, in a good manner or in a clear way that they got, you know, I check myself first and that includes, do I have biases against mm. this person? Any, any, you know, internal biases that I may have or a context about this person. So, um, I check that first. The other thing I'll ask myself is that because for me personally, I tend to put off difficult conversations like, all of us, I'm a human being too. And I tend to procrastinate on conversations that I know are going to be tough. Um, and I stop myself and I'll ask myself when I'm about to, you know, engage in these difficult conversations and I find myself, you know, waiting for the right time, the right moment, the right alignment of the stars, who knows what I ask myself, what's the risk? What's the cost? If I keep being quiet, if I don't speak up, if I'm not candid, what's the risk? What's the cost? What do I gain? What do we gain? What does the team gain? What does the, the company, the organization gain? If I actually get over my fear of this, I tackle that challenge 
and I have the conversation and it actually goes well, what do we stand to gain? Usually I'll find that the gain is far greater than, uh, than the opposite of not saying anything. Uh, you know what I mean? It's worse to not say anything. The risks are too great. So I have to speak up. And then when I go into the difficult conversation, what I have found has been helpful is I show vulnerability, first of all, by saying, let's say it's you, Rashad, that I have to have this, I have to confront you on something. You're not pulling your weight on the team or whatever it is, right? I got to confront you on it. The risks are too great if I don't. The risks are too great for the team, for the organization, what have you, if I don't. And the risk is great for you. I'm not serving you well if, if I don't point out and help you course correct, as we say, and improve, right? Yet it's a difficult conversation. So before engaging in, the, or as I start to engage in the conversation with you, I'll show some vulnerability. And yeah, vulnerable means open to attack. I get it. I've had arguments and discussions with people about using this word vulnerability, but I like it. Vulnerable. Yeah, I'm a human being and I'm, 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 I have soft spots. I'll start the conversation with you, Rashad, by saying, hey, Rashad, this is, it, this is challenging for me to bring up. This is difficult for me to say, number one. And I may also add, depending on the situation, and Rashad, there might be more to the story here that I'm not aware of. There might be more to the story here that, I don't, that I'm not aware of. But with what I do know, man, I got to talk with you. The last two times you've not delivered on time with those deliverables we were expecting. You were late by two days. It set the other team back, et cetera. And then I'll go into my conversation very quickly and just give the example. And then before giving any feedback and saying, here's what I think you should do, Rashad. Here's how you can improve. I will stop after I say, hey, here's what I've witnessed. Here's what I've observed, Rashad. Difficult for me to have this conversation with you, but I got to have it. Here's what I'm here to, to share with you, what I've seen. Can you tell me what was going on there? And then you'll, you will fill in any blanks. Yes, Luis, that happened, but here's why. We're short-staffed and X, Y, Z or what have you. Ah, okay. So now, again, I'm seeing more of the picture. We're able, we're better able to have this conversation, have a better outcome of this, diff, what was a difficult conversation, right? If you respond to me with, well, Luis, mind your own business. What's it to you anyway? Well, then I can give you the feedback. I can come in and say, well, hey, Rashad, here's why, X, Y, Z. Or you may say, yeah, Luis, this is what happened. It's a reasonable explanation. Then you and I can problem solve. It turns into a different kind of conversation. So I hope that answered uh, your listener's question. First of all, I examine myself and then I go in and show some vulnerability and being open to learn more in the conversation about the situation. Absolutely. And I think those are some great, you know, quick takeaways in that. And for the, for the other listeners on the podcast right now is, you know, check yourself and show some vulnerability, but also the phrasing that you, you used, you know, a lot of my career, um, you, we learned by learning a phrase and being able to replicate the phrase in a sales environment or whatever the case is. It's like, say this to your customer and get comfortable saying that and then it becomes easier to use. So the phrasing that you described, you know, uh, you know, this is difficult for me to bring up. It's challenging for me. I think that's a good phrase for people to remember. And then the other thing was that you said was there may be more to the story that I'm not aware of, you know, and it gives them the, the, the ability to, to say, yeah, there is. And it opens the, the door to the conversation. Yes. And that's what I want is a conversation. I want to know, help me understand what the heck is going on here, Rashad. And then let's tackle it. Let's, let's, let's fix it. Now, if I can just jump in really quick and say up to this point, I've had people in my, in my sessions say up to this point, well, that's all great in a perfect world, Luis. And it even sounds kind of warm and fuzzy. So I want to make sure that your listeners understand that there's also resolution here because if I'm confronting you on something, Rashad, and you tell me, yeah, that happened, I slipped up, then we have to have a conversation, maybe just as challenging about, okay, what, what are we going to do now? Because that can't happen anymore, you know, and that leads into more, you know, another kind of a perhaps challenging conversation. But my point I wanted to make is there, oh, there's resolution for sure. It's not just, oh, tell me what's going on. And it's all, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I think, resolution. I think anyone listening to this and myself included can think of, more than one time for sure that you know having a conversation was a tough and then b like what did you do about it afterward what was the resolution so yeah. important to remember yeah. um 
nice little dovetail, I think, into what we've just been talking about. Another listener question from Paul, again in BC, is uh, how do you ask questions that can be highly confrontational without escalating the situation? How can you ask questions that can be highly confrontational without escalating the situation? Okay, I'm gonna. I, I hate to assume. I generally don't do it. I don't recommend. But since he's not here, I'm gonna assume he doesn't mean in a in a group setting. No. So I would never do that in a group setting. First of mm-hmm. all, so let's take that out of the equation. Always go one on one if you've got something controversial or something that's you know you're thinking might be controversial, what have you. Uh, do it one on one. The second thing is again. This, what I just shared with you, Rashad, and not to repeat it again, but the same thing works in this kind of a situation. One on one, it could be. Uh, what was the? What were the words he used? Can you repeat those uh, words? Highly confrontational, uh, without escalating the situation. Highly confrontational. In other words, you're going to confront someone. It's exactly what I just shared with you. Hey, Rashad, I need to talk with you. Let's forget about. Oh, this is difficult for me to say, and all that. We'll forget about that for a moment, Rashad. I'd like to talk with you about blank, whatever it is that happened. Here's the example. Yesterday, you and I both know that happened. And then last week, that happened too. Remember, I talked with you about it. It's two examples already. The risks are great, Rashad, when that happens. So I point out the risks to you because maybe you don't see them. When that happens, Rashad, and as I just pointed out, it's happened two times that I'm aware of, okay? When that happens, here are the effects on the next team. And eventually it's a domino effect that leads to our clients. It leads to our customers. If we lose customers, Rashad, that's not good. So this has to stop. <laughs> and, and I can do this all in one minute. I've timed myself. This is what we do at Fear. So you can get it out of the gate in one minute. So, cause I want to get to the conversation and then I can get to you and say, so tell me Rashad, what's going on? That's confronting. That's radical candor. I already excluded the part about this is difficult for me to say or what have you, right? I will recognize my role in it. Rashad, I should have brought this up to you earlier. I didn't. I avoided the conversation, but here we are. Let's talk about this, Rashad, because it can't go on. What's happening from your perspective? Help me understand. And then we'll engage in the conversation and then we'll go, okay, what do we need to do to resolve this? You tell me, what do you need to do to resolve this, Rashad? What kind of support do you need from me? Rashad. And then even better, because this is what we do at Fierce is what I teach. Let's check back in two weeks, Rashad, see your progress, see if we need to adjust the plan, if any at all, what kind of support you might need. How about Friday at nine? You good? (laughs) Get it on the calendar. You show support that way. Number one, I'm saying it kind of tongue in cheek, but hey, this isn't just a goodbye. You better fix the issue. Uh, or else this is, no, I'm genuinely interested, Rashad, in in supporting you so we can move on and you can move on. So I'm going to check back with you in two weeks. Um, So that's how I do that. That's how I handle a a very confrontational situation that could get out of hand. It's just stating the facts and including what my role in it was, but showing accountability in this case. For sure. I touch a little bit on, um, you know, difficult communication through through the team, right? So we've kind of established the the leader's role and the leader's responsibility in having difficult conversations and uh, radical candor, um, you know. But like for your for your team, like <clears throat> you need to encourage that amongst your team, you know, strengthen the communication amongst the team. Like where where are we starting here? What can we do to um, kind of tie this into what a leader is doing with their team right now? What I have found worked for me coming up back in the day and what I have seen work for others and what I train is get the team together for a decision that needs to be made. And I'm not talking about moving big mountains or big initiatives or anything like that. But if there's anything on the team uh, that needs to be decided, an initiative, a new process or something like that, that a decision that would best be made by maybe hearing from different perspectives, get the team in on that, get their input, their feedback on how or what they think should be done in that situation, get collaboration going, and then follow through with what the team recommends. Again, this is not a big issue that's going to you know, lose clients or cause the company to fold or anything, but what I call the low-hanging fruit, small things that you can let the team 
make the decision on, enact it, and then celebrate their success for that. And even company wide, when you know maybe the team gets accolades or whatever, you can point it out. Hey, these three individuals actually made that happen. So that also builds trust on the team. It creates ownership. It creates accountability, and people actually feel that they actually have a, they have a voice. Their voice is heard. Their opinions matter. Um, the worst thing you can do now. Here's the flip side of this. So again, it's low hanging fruit. Here's a decision we got to make. What do you all think we should do? Let's come up with a con- with, a, with you know, let's collaborate and make a decision. We'll move forward with it. If it is something that you know as the leader you can't do, you got to be candid and tell them that. Hey, great idea, but I can't do it. Here's why. And then you're able to, you know, you tell them how much you're able to tell them. Of course, leaders were not always, you know, uh, able to share everything, but you tell them why. What you don't want to do, though, is say, hey, thanks for the input. That was great. Awesome team. And then you still do what you were going to do in the first place. I call that the illusion of inclusion. And that's like acid on trust. You know, that that will erode trust in a second. So how you build the trust is by getting the collaboration going and the team decision making, the ownership of it. And the celebration of the success of it, don't forget that, and building on that. So I hope that answers the question. Mm -hmm. Getting the team Um, dynamic going. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, like, I mean, we're talking about difficult conversations, and we know that healthy conflict in organizations is an important aspect of innovation and progress. You kind of refer to some of this as like the cost benefit of saying something. Um, so still kind of, I guess on the, on the team subject and even for leadership communication, like encouraging healthy conflict and at the same time having difficult conversations without damaging te- the team, like where is the balance there? The balance <laughs> That's a good question. So no, maybe I don't understand the question. Repeat the question for me, please. So, just, you know, in talking about healthy conflict in organizations being an important aspect of innovation and progress. So how do you encourage healthy conflict and at the same time have difficult conversations without damaging the team? And how do you find that balance? The way I look at it is, and this is how I share it with teams that I've led, we have different ideas, we have different perspectives. And they're just perspectives. So first of all, don't take it so personally. These are just different perspectives. And we need we need the collaboration. And we actually need the, the way we're going to make the best decision is by hearing from the devil's advocates, by hearing from the people who are going to poke holes in our idea, by hearing from the team members that are, that are actually going to have the, the courage to go, Luis, hold on a second. You think it's a great idea, but maybe you haven't thought it out all the way. So I look at it as a benefit. We need to have, like you, as you call it, the healthy, uh, did you call it healthy conflict, I think, yep. or something yep. like that? Mm-hmm. I look at it as a healthy conversation. Hey, I see it differently, Rashad. And in fact, if you and I have a good relationship because we've built trust over a period of time, I can actually tell you with a straight face, I think your idea is nuts, Rashad. I see it <laughs> totally differently, but hey, let's talk about it. Tell, convince me why is your idea so great? So we can do that once the trust is built. But I always impress upon my teams when I led large teams, and I share this with leaders that I work with because a lot of leaders don't get this. You want people to poke holes in your ideas and your plans because that's how you're going to strengthen them up. I don't want somebody telling me how wonderful I am and blowing smoke uh, and not telling me. That's what we're talking about, radical candor. I mean, imagine I'm the boss and I go into the meeting and I say, okay, this is what I'm moving forward with. Any thoughts or any questions? And I get the corporate nod. I call it the corporate nod. And then I like roll out my plan or whatever it is, only to hit with the disaster two quarters later. And I look at my team and like, you guys maybe saw this coming and nobody like told me, no one alerted me. Where does the trust go there? Or maybe I'm not the boss. Maybe I'm a colleague and my other colleagues didn't speak up and say, hey, maybe there's a roadblock, Luis. So where does the trust? So I encourage that. We need it. I want to hear the different perspectives. Please poke holes in my ideas, be the devil's advocates and everyone else expect that. 
It's okay. Don't take it personally. There are perspectives. And at the end of the day, we'll collaborate and we'll make a decision. And sometimes at the end of the day, if I'm the leader, I will have to make that decision and I'll share with you why I made that decision. So that's Great. how. Cool. All right. Um, got one more question for you before we start to wrap things up. Sure. Um, and uh, I don't know, maybe we'll call this the takeaway question. Okay. So um, you've mentioned a few times throughout the conversation today about, you know, there's that fear uh, of giving feedback or having a tough conversation. You know, it's going to be tough, a little bit fearful. You kind of hold back, you procrastinate about it. Um, so I'd like to hear any tips or strategies that you have about dealing with that and about how um, anyone listening to this podcast right now could start having better conversations right away. Wow. It's, uh, a mouthful. Let's do it. So, <laughs> so I start with this premise, our careers, our companies, our relationships, heck our lives either succeed or fail happens gradually then suddenly one conversation at a time. So if we look at our lives, our relationships and our careers, it's a series of connecting dots of conversations. So I start there. That's, you know, where do I need to go? What results do I need to get? What is it I want in terms of my goals? How do I want my life to be? And who do I need to have conversations with to help me get there? So we're all navigating our lives one conversation at a time. So an obstacle for many of us, including me, I'll speak for myself here, is we're in love with our own beliefs, our own practices, our own way of life, our own perspectives, and we're so convinced that we're right, uh, we don't entertain the possibility that there, our truths may have only elements of truth in them, right? Or maybe they were true once upon a time, they're no longer true today. You can just look at our current political debate going on in the U.S. or what was going on in the U.S. So from my perspective, when my version of the truth is cast in bronze, the way I see things, the way I see people, the way I uh, view and see and interpret my company, my team, my boss, my organization, with all of that, when my version of the truth is cast in bronze, version of all that is cast in stone or bronze, when I suppress all evidence to the contrary by silencing those who see things differently, like we were talking about a minute ago, and by continuing to practice my same old habits and the same way of conversing with people, um, my opportunities become smaller and smaller. No person is right all the time about everything. And that's why I started off this conversation by saying it's so important for us to get curious, interrogate reality so that we can find out more about how other people see it, because I may not have the whole truth, right? So we've got to be aware of how strong we hold our views and realize other people have very different views. And I think we should become curious about how other people think and see things and get curious and say things like, tell me more about that, because then I'm able to really see things more clearly how you see it, and I'm able to engage Build that trust, strengthen the relationship, and thus we both, you know, we achieve the results we want, whatever those are, if we're talking about in the workplace. So mm. that's what I have to say. That's that's <laughs> my that's my last that's my last I, bite of wisdom, if you want I, to call I, it that. Yeah, okay. I think I put you on the spot with that one. That was a big question. That was a big one. <laughs> well, I, I I like it and you answered well. So um Appreciate that. You know, as we just go to the end of the podcast here, I'll give you a chance to um, kind of plug in where people can connect with you and where you want to send sure. folks to find out more. But um, before we get there, what is one thing you know about life or leadership that you wish everyone knew? One thing about life or leadership that I wish everyone knew, we talked about it earlier, but I'm going to repeat it. And this has been landing for me again and again, especially now with COVID and being separated. Look, our most valuable currency is not money. It's not how smart we are, not how attractive we think we are, how self-sufficient we are, how charismatic we are. Our most valuable currency is relationship. As I mentioned earlier, two Nobel Prizes were won because the researchers proved we human beings are hardwired emotionally. So relationships are super important. Um, two distinguished experts I already mentioned proved it. So one thing I know about life or leadership I wish everyone knew is 
the nature of our the nature of our relationships are directly affected by the nature of our conversations. Whatever I put into my conversations, truth, candor, honesty, fun, I'm going to get that out of the relationship. If I withhold things from the conversation, honesty, authenticity, fun, I can't expect that in the relationship. The two are directly related, and that's where the radical candor comes in, right? I don't want to hold back. I want to share with you what's really happening, what's really, I want to be authentic. I want to be honest so that I'll get that in our relationship. So that's the one thing I wish uh, everyone knew and wish I had known earlier. (laughs) Excellent. Um, When it's all said and done, what three words do you want to be used to describe your life? It's going to sound so cliche, but it's true. It's really real for me. So I'll say it. He lived with passion, (laughs) kindness, and love, capital O-L-V-E. It's my goal. That's what I want to be remembered by. Thanks for asking that. No problem. I'm glad that you could share that with us. Uh, Lewis, where do you want people to connect with you? Where can they find out more about what you're doing? Uh, Maybe dig into the communication resources there a little bit more. Sure. There's two ways to get in touch with me. So um, if you liked what we were talking about, and you want to talk more about or engage more regarding the transformation of communication in your team or uh, your company or organization, make your own communication more effective, go to our website, fierceinc.com, F-I-C, excuse me, F-I-E-R-C-E-I-N-C.com forward slash resources. You'll find tons of resources there that you can actually download for free. Uh, including nine fun ways to stay connected while working remotely, uh, which I had fun designing. Uh, But there's a lot more resources as well there. So please go to there and check it out. Um, Also, if you enjoyed our conversation today, I'd love to connect with you on my LinkedIn page. Uh, I love expanding my network and it would be an honor and a pleasure to expand it more with your listeners. So go to linkedin.com forward slash I N forward slash Luis Gonzalez, G-O-N-Z-A-L-E-S. And connect with me. Let's continue the conversation. Awesome. Well, Luis, thank you so much for joining me today. This was an excellent conversation. I appreciate your communication skills. And uh, I look forward to sharing this with everyone listening. We'll talk again, I hope, in, in the future. I hope so too, Rashad. It was really sincerely an honor and a pleasure. Thank you. If you've enjoyed what you've heard today, Would you head over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts and subscribe, leave me a rating, leave me a review, and share this with a friend. It spreads the word and helps the podcast grow. You can also find me on social media at R.E. Oberlander. Until next time, stay awesome.